ethics, and trust. So uh, if you are joining us on Zoom, just remember to submit your questions using the Q&A feature there. We'll incorporate those. We want these all to be interactive sessions uh, as we go. Um, and uh, for that purpose, uh, we really do want this to be an integrated discussion building on themes from our first session two weeks ago uh, and continuing um, throughout the morning. So I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Professor Hathaway to say a little bit uh, and welcome everyone and introduce the panel. I'm moderating the panel, so I'm gonna have to scoot off this podium in just a second, but Professor Hathaway uh, is the Bernice and Latrobe Smith Professor of International Law at, at Yale Law School, Director of the Center for Global Legal Challenges, faculty member of the Jackson Institute, and has been a part of this cyber forum now uh, for about five years. So thank you, Ona, for your leadership uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Ted, um, and welcome everyone. It's so great to see you all here. Um, uh, as you know, this is a second session um, in a series of three sessions. Uh, and today we're talking about disinformation and the future of democracy, which is a very timely topic. And we're gonna consider a range of issues here today. How can AI tools detect deep fakes and other forms of coordinated inauthentic behavior online? How can democratic policymakers and social media companies, companies counter the threat of disinformation and online extremism without impinging on free speech and other fundamental freedoms? And we'll be asking as well, what are some of the most effective techniques for educating citizens to the threat of disinformation to try and disable its effects? Now, our topic today is sadly relevant to the devastating events unfolding in Ukraine today. Um, Russia has long used fake accounts and bots to spread disinformation on social media, including during its 2014 uh, campaign to annex Crimea and the 2016 presidential election. Uh, in the current set of events, uh, there was a recent announcement by Nathaniel Gleischer, who is a graduate of Yale Law School, a frequent speaker at this forum, uh, though not this year, because we're focusing on folks who are currently uh, uh, at Yale or in the region. Um, and he's currently the head of security policy for Meta, Facebook's parent company. He said that Meta had uncovered Russian efforts to undermine trust in the Ukrainian government in a separate attempt to hack Ukrainian mil military officials and journalists using its platform. They removed these accounts and blocked the associated websites. They also found links to another network of fake accounts that it removed in 2020 that involved people in Russia and the Donbass region of Ukraine, as well as two Crimean media organizations now sanctioned by the US government. And after Meta um, uh, detected these accounts, they notified Twitter and Google and other social media companies. Twitter then turned around and banned more than a dozen accounts connected to the disinformation campaign. Google also took down a number of YouTube uh, channels that were, that were engaged in disinformation. So, as events are unfolding in Ukraine, uh, we're seeing uh, the effort to try and um, learn the lessons of the past to try and combat disinformation um, and try to disable its effects in the, in the current event. And I, though that wasn't sort of centrally what we had planned to talk about when we set this up, event up you know, many months ago, um, it just so happens that, that uh, this is a great occasion to, to touch on those events as well. So our first panel this morning uh, is talking about detecting deep fakes and coordinated inauthentic behavior. And we have an amazing panel with us to talk about these issues. So first we have Beth Goldberg, who's the research program manager uh, at Jigsaw. Um, she's a graduate of Jackson and currently uh, works, as I mentioned, at Jack Jigsaw. She manages research on violent extremism and interviews former violent extremists uh, from across ideologies and geographies. And she applies research on evolving hate speech and hate groups to inform Google policy and inspire products that, count, that counter radicalization online. And next we have uh, Josh Lamb, who's a current graduate student at Jackson. Uh, before coming to Yale, he worked as an associate as, at ID Insight, a uh, global advisory data analytics and research organization in the international development sector. At Yale, Josh is uh, pursuing a joint degree at the Jackson Institute and School of Management. Um, he hopes to explore ways to mitigate societal harms posed by technology platforms, particularly in low income contexts. Next, uh, we have Libby Lang, who's also a graduate student at Jackson. 
she's a uh, she's engaged in the first year of the master's program there. Uh, prior to coming to Yale, Libby worked as the lead English speech writer and social media manager for Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, at Yale, Libby plans to study U.S.-China policy with focus on uh, disinformation mitigation strategies and democratic resilience. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, John Tervosky, uh, who's a current PhD candidate at the Department of Political Science at Yale. Um, uh, and, and he's also getting his master's in statistics at Yale. His research focus is on causal inference and persuasion, especially in the context of large scale social networks. Uh, before coming to Yale, he was senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School at the Student Social Support R&D Lab, a uh, lab focusing, specializing in large scale field experiments in education. Uh, and last but not least, uh, my co-organizer of this forum, my partner in crime in putting this together for, for many years, uh, he's a co-director um, uh, of this forum, as I mentioned, executive director of the International Security Studies um, uh, Program, and he's a lecturer at the Jackson Institute of Global Affairs. Um, he's really the person who originally came up with the idea of doing this series um, he's the one who really does all the hard work behind the, behind the scenes and has really helped drive the creation of a community of scholars um, and academics and students working on issues related to cyber um, and evolving new technology. So we're really lucky to have him here with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Um, and it's just, it's just a thrill to see uh, both current and former students on the podium. Uh, and by the way, Ona, I did learn, John is now a former student, got the PhD in December. So congratulations, uh, John, for now being a, a doctor, doctor of political science at Yale. So part of really what we wanted to do uh, with the focus on disinformation uh, today is again, think about how this is evolving into the cybersecurity landscape. And as many of you know, disinformation really was not considered part of cybersecurity as it might have been sort of originally defined, right? It's not about the, the systems and the networks themselves as much as it's about the people and our perceptions. And so it's really the human dimension of cybersecurity that I think gets really uh, elevated very much as we talk about uh, the deep fake challenge as well as misinformation uh, and online extremism. So I'm hopeful we can bring that out as we sort of work on our kind of definitional concepts here about cybersecurity and sort of bridge the divide uh, across the Yale campus. Because the social science research that I think we'll highlight today has a lot to contribute to some of the technical uh, discourse that we talked about uh, in the previous session um, as well. So I wanted to start with, with Josh and, and Libby, who, uh, and we also have some, uh, some slides and, and sort of visuals that might help illustrate uh, some of the challenges. And so Josh and Libby, as current Jackson students, are, are the co-author of a recent paper that we've assigned for those who are taking the forum for credit. Uh, the paper is White Noise, Pro-Government Tactics to Shape Xinjiang Discourse Are Online Are Evolving. Uh, this work was recently cited uh, by the New York Times. It's an example of how the Chinese government uh, deploys sophisticated disinformation tools uh, as an element of statecraft. And what's interesting is despite all the widespread abuses of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang that we read about, it's hard to detect a lot of it online on Western platforms. And they're identifying this phenomenon called, that they're terming white noise. And I just was hoping they might say a little bit about it because it's a slightly different way of thinking about disinformation uh, than I think a lot of us have previously thought about it, right? Which is sort of obviously false or deliberately misleading, but here it's sort of a, a narrative shaping function uh, that's much more sophisticated and much more subtle. So maybe I, I'll just ask uh, Josh and Libby or whichever would want to go first, uh, just spend a, just a quick few minutes here to tell us what white noise is and, and how uh, you've begun to discover and, and discern it. So thank you very much. Yep, uh, green, there you go. There we go, okay. Yep. Yeah, so I guess um, to give a bit of background on how we came across this white noise um, and how this project came to be, um, Josh and I are both interested and have a bit of background um, in China-related issues um, and in disinformation specifically. And so we were thinking about how to sort of marry these two interests um, 
And we were thinking about that um, in March of 2021. And that was, um, for those who don't know, around the time of the Xinjiang cotton incident, which is when Chinese netizens organized a boycott of Western brands who had said that they were going to stop sourcing cotton from Xinjiang over their concerns over human rights abuses. Um, and so we really saw a spike in the conversation around Xinjiang on Western social media platforms around this time. And so we had thought about trying to identify possible disinformation narratives um, related to this incident. And as we got farther into thinking about this idea, we realized that we didn't actually know much about the shape of the conversation overall. Like what were people talking about, um, about Xinjiang online? And so that's where the idea came to just rather than search for something really specific to kind of pull everything out and see what that looked like. And so um, in doing so in pulling out this entire conversation, that was sort of how we identified what we termed white noise. Um, and so you can see over here, we've like put together um, a few examples of what we call white noise. And so on the left, you can see sort of one, one prong of that part of the conversation, um, which is this sort of beautiful Xinjiang narrative that Xinjiang is just this beautiful, natural, pristine place. Um, you know, there's no mention of the people there or obviously anything that is happening there. It's just focusing on sharing these beautiful landscapes. Um, and actually on the bottom, you can see that that's actually a verified um, state affiliated account. That's an embassy, I think in Austria um, sharing this content. And then on the right, you can see um, another prong of the conversation, which is basically talking about how happy the people in Xinjiang are. Look, about, look at them going about their daily lives. Um, how could anything be wrong there? Um, and so this sort of, this sort of shifting the narrative um, makes Xinjiang out to be a much um, happier place than we know it to be. Um, just to add on to that, I one common reaction that you might have looking at this content is that it just doesn't seem very convincing, right? Like you're not about to change your entire opinion about China just from being exposed to this content. But I think it's important to keep in mind that the target audience of this content isn't necessarily the people in the room. The target audience is someone who is much less informed and much less engaged politically on China-related issues. So you can imagine someone um, who has a job that has nothing to do with China or geopolitics searching up Xinjiang in the Twitter search box and then um, getting bombarded by content like this. So images of picturesque mountains in Xinjiang or videos of happy dancing Uyghur women. And that is the intention of this um, content. It is to distract from the very serious human rights issues occurring in Xinjiang to make it more difficult to find credible reports from outlets such as BBC and, C and, and the New York Times who've done tremendous work exposing um, the, the labor camps and, and the um, of the human rights abuses occurring in the region, and more importantly, to drown out the voices of Uyghur activists who have tried so hard online to um, advocate um, for policymakers to, to do something about the suffering of their people. I liked, uh, Josh, that, that use of the term uh, distraction, right? So uh, in Libya, I was just wondering if you might comment a little bit about this, just also just in terms of how you found uh, some of this data. Uh, and so uh, the effect here, right, is that the hashtags when you're looking for information about Uyghurs or what's going on in Xinjiang, you're getting bombarded with a lot of alternative narratives, right? So it, it's distracting you from the main uh, purpose maybe of what you were looking for, what you were originally uh, concerned about. And if I understood correctly, you found these images as an example uh, with an analysis of over uh, nearly 300,000 Xinjiang related tweets uh, and you collected them uh, over the course of six months. So just maybe help us understand for a minute how it was that you detected and identified the white noise. Because again, I think part of what we're focused on in bridging the divide is sort of how do you combine sort of social science with technical concepts. So uh, tell us about, you know, the Jackson uh, coursework or uh, other technical skills that you needed for, for the analysis that might have pulled this data out in the first place? Yeah, I can talk um, a bit about the technical side first. Um, so as you mentioned, we used a data set of almost 300,000 tweets that we scraped ourselves. And obviously, this was way too much content for us to an analyze manually or, or look through and find meaningful insights on our own. Um, and so taking our knowledge of, of the issue itself, um, we used a technique called topic modeling, which is a machine learning technique where you can feed a huge amount of text data into an algorithm and it can help, it can help identify um, possible 
topics across the entire corpus of the text um, according to how terms co-occur together. So when words appear together frequently, um, the algorithm identifies that as a possible topic. And so in looking through the data manually ourselves, we had actually already identified some of this kind of content. And we had found that interesting that um, that was something unexpected that we hadn't, we hadn't thought would be there. But we were very surprised to see that actually the algorithm itself also identified that. And so that was for us proof of sort of how prevalent this was in the conversation overall, that without us telling the algorithm to look for that, it also found it. Yeah. Uh, Josh, any thoughts on, on the technical piece? And then I also wanted to ask you uh, a policy question, but, but go ahead and, and think sure. about it. Yep. Yeah, I think I can speak a little bit about how um, Jackson has prepared us for this project. So this project actually began as a final project for a class. It was Casey King's course, uh, Python for Global Affairs. And so we uh, did like a smaller scope version of the project. We received really good feedback uh, from Professor King and we decided to expand on it over the course of the summer. And so I think that is one great thing about Jackson, if I could plug it <laughs> a little bit. I think like we were given a lot of flexibility to take technical courses. Um, in other departments. Um, I know that Libby and I have both taken a number of technical courses since then. And I know that if we um, had to tackle this project or a version of this project, again, we have a much wider set of tools that presumably would lead to, um, you know, even, even deeper insights uh, based on the data set that we had. It's a good example, I think, of a, a combination of the technical uh, law and policy skills. And then to put on the policy hat here, I think one question uh, Libby, it would be, you know, what are solutions, right? So you've identified the white noise, right? So what are some solutions that you might think of for how social media companies or others might be able to eliminate these from platforms or create proper warnings, right? It may not necessarily be uh, false, actual false information, right? So it does raise some sort of complicated law and policy questions about how you would define white noise. So, you know, what, what do you think is the right way to combat uh, something like this? Yeah, I think on the social media side, um, you're correct that it is um, very complicated and is not necessarily a case of just taking down content or removing accounts. Um, if you can't identify necessarily a very specific way that they're violating um, the terms of use. And so one uh, possible solution we proposed in our paper is the idea of Twitter creating a flag for this content. Um, and there's quite a bit of precedent for this. Um, Twitter has done it, for instance, around the 2020 election um, or for conversations such as about COVID-19 vaccines. And this flag may say something um, just that um, here are some more authoritative resources on this issue because um, it, is, it is a contentious issue. And so this could be placed on individual pieces of content that mention Xinjiang or um, could be placed, for instance, at the top of search results when people search it. Um, and I think this serves a twofold purpose, um, first being that it gives people easier access to credible information because, um, as Josh already mentioned, a lot of people probably are not going to go out of their way to seek out um, extensive information if they're on social media. Um, and second, we think of it as a way to sort of prime people's um, prime people's thought processes that maybe they should slow down and think for a second about the content they're consuming. Um, we hope that when you see a flag like that, you, you can be a little more critical about maybe um, what account is, is sharing that content and maybe why they're pushing that narrative specifically. Um, you know, uh, I just want to, you know, as Ona was encouraging us to think about Russia-Ukraine parallels, uh, before I go on to John, uh, Josh, I just, was curious in your reaction uh, as you thought about this type of sophisticated Chinese disinformation and narrative shaping. You know, why are we not necessarily seeing that in the in the Russia context in Ukraine at, at the moment? Uh, you know, people have seen saying Russia's lost uh, the information war. You're not maybe it's just impossible to show fuzzy images of the situation in Kiev at the moment, but. You know, as you think of sort of the Chinese lesson learned here, uh, and then compare it to what's happening uh, now in uh, in Eastern Europe, um, you know, what's going through your mind ab about that? Yeah, I think it's a it's a very tough question, and I think part of what makes it tough is that it's almost like comparing apples and oranges to some extent. On the one hand, you have this Ukraine war, which is a you know very fast moving issue. There is news happening every day by the hour. 
On the other hand, you have the Xinjiang issue, which is a very slow burn issue, which people have paid very little attention, uh, even though the Uyghur people have suffered under the hand of the Chinese government for many years. Um, so keeping keeping that in mind, I still think there are certain lessons to be drawn, I think, or, or parallels. Um, to draw a contrast, I think one huge difference is that the Chinese government just has so much more control over the information, information infrastructure in the Xinjiang province compared to Ukraine. For example, China has a history of shutting down the internet or tar targeting people who've used VPNs in the Xinjiang region and shutting down their, their internet specifically. Um, this is just not the case in Ukraine. We've seen, I think, part of why um, the Russian kind of information efforts have been perceived to be less successful is that there's just so many videos being posted on social media platforms that have then been verified by the OSINT community online. Um, that just um, because of the closed information ecosystem in China, that's just less possible. Gosh. We'll come back uh, to this great uh, China study in a moment. I obviously want to get uh, questions and reactions from everyone here, but I want to turn it over to John and shift gears. And he has some, some videos as well that I want to uh, display on the screen. And so we're moving kind of along the disinformation continuum here, right? So uh, what, what Josh and Libby have, have shown us are examples of sort of manipulated narratives. And, but what John's research has shown and focused on are actual manipulated media. So actual you know, forged media, so-called deep fakes, including ones that he has uh, designed himself for his study, which we'll get into, uh, but we'll have a little video interlude here, uh, which might tee up the conversation. So over to you, John. Yep, thanks. Um, so uh, to, to start off, uh, I, I think it, it makes sense uh, for everybody to, to see just how convincing a deep fake video can be. So uh, we basically have two videos. One is a real video that we commissioned an actor uh, to record. And then we essentially made a deep fake version of the same video by using the deep fake technology to kind of simulate the synthetic quality of a deep fake without changing the actual content. So the speech is exactly identical, but one is a real video and one has all of the visual characteristics of a deep fake. So uh, I, I just wanted to do a quick poll uh, as to uh, which video is real. So we're, we're gonna play um, uh, the, well, the left video first and then, right. and then the right video. And, and then uh, uh, as, as you watch this video, just, just try to detect which, which video is the fake. Right. So here comes the left one. I believe that the future of healthcare is going to involve a mix of old and new methods of treatment. Despite what the pharmaceutical companies tell you, it turns out that not all medical professionals think that the best way to treat cancer is to simply zap bodies with radiation and hand out more pills. Natural and organic essential oils are safer, more affordable, and more effective at treating and even curing cancer than the drugs sold by pharmaceutical companies. If I am elected, the first thing I will do is work to pass a law requiring doctors to use essential oils to treat cancer. Only if essential oils don't work will they be allowed to use pharmaceutical drugs, radiation, and conventional medicine. I believe that this will save the American healthcare system millions of dollars every year and save countless lives. All right. Number two. Okay. I believe that the future of healthcare is going to involve a mix of old and new methods of treatment. Despite what the pharmaceutical companies tell you, it turns out that not all medical professionals think that the best way to treat cancer is to simply zap bodies with radiation and hand out more pills. Natural and organic essential oils are safer, more affordable, and more effective at treating and even curing cancer than the drugs sold by pharmaceutical companies. If I am elected, the first thing I will do is work to pass a law requiring doctors to use essential oils to treat cancer. Only if essential oils don't work will they be allowed to use pharmaceutical drugs, radiation, and conventional medicine. I believe that this will save the American healthcare system millions of dollars every year and save countless lives. 
All right. So uh, just as a as a quick side note, we did debrief uh, our participants that essential oils cannot treat cancer. Just throwing that out there out of a, uh, an ethical um, consideration. But uh, as, a, as a quick poll, uh, how many of you, uh, just raise your hand, how many of you think uh, the left video is real? So two, uh, what about the right video? Okay. So um, can somebody click? I think that. Oh. <laughs> so it is very, very convincing. Um, I, I find it difficult to tell the two apart and I, I made the deep fake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give you a second to tell us how you did it because I think that that's actually pretty, pretty relevant again to this technical conversation about bridging the divide. And, and so, you know, and again, we've assigned uh, your paper here as well. You, you uh, Josh, wrote uh, along with uh, Yale Statistics and Data Science and Political Science professors, uh, Kala and Arno, uh, this paper on deep fake warnings for political videos, uh, increase disbelief, but do not improve discernment, uh, evidence from two experiments. So um, perhaps one of these is the experiments. But Help us understand just prior to the findings, right? So to test deep fakes, you have to actually create them. So you're learning some lessons here about the technology and how we're using these open source tools. So can you just give us a sense of that? And then we'll get into how you then deploy it as a social science experiment. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the, the technology for deep fakes has, has changed rapidly. And basically what, what you, you saw just now, that, that's a, a deep fake circa two years ago. Um, and they're getting more and more convincing, but also the tools to make them are getting easier and easier. And uh, you know, some of you may have heard of uh, this news story about a Pennsylvania woman, uh, the, the cheer mom, who was accused of making a deep fake. And you know, the news media was like, okay, well, it's, it's so easy that you know, even, even this uh, middle-class woman from Pennsylvania, who's you know, this, this uh, cheerleader mom is making deep fakes of rival cheerleaders. Turns out that that video was not a deep fake. Um, law enforcement uh, looked at this video and uh, an officer just made the judgment call that uh, he thought it was a deep fake. Um, but once this case, uh, and this is a criminal case, once this case uh, received more attention from uh, deep fake experts and video experts, they found no evidence that the video was a deep fake. So uh, just, just to emphasize, uh, we're not at the point where any given person can make a deep fake. It, it does require some technical skills. Um, and I think a, a great analog is, is computers in the 90s. So uh, a lot of hobbyists are making deep fakes uh, because all of the information to make a deep fake is out there. Um, there's a lot of code, a lot of packages such as Deep Face Lab that have tutorials and uh, communities, uh, uh, web forums that help guide uh, people who want to make deep fakes to make deep fakes. So basically what I did uh, was mostly use uh, uh, command line in, in Windows, so, so batch uh, programming. And it, it doesn't really require you to be a computer scientist. It doesn't really require you to have a deep knowledge of programming. Uh, if you know a little bit about IT, if you know a little bit about programming, it's actually fairly easy uh, to get to a pretty effective deep fake. But to this day, uh, deep fakes, uh, deep fake manufacturers still a little bit of an art um, in the sense that uh, the algorithm, the package will get you 90% there, but the final 10% is a lot of tweaking options. It's a lot of uh, touching up uh, frame by frame uh, the resulting video. And that's why, you know, there are tech startups. There's, there's a pay for deep fake services out there that uh, you know, try to be ethical, try to frame themselves as, oh, okay, we have this, this marketing tool, you just pay us money, we'll make you deep fakes. 
so you know it's it's a it's an evolving process um, and it's getting easier and easier but we're not at the point where where the average American is is going to easily make a deep fake um, but we're, we're moving in that direction uh, thank you for that so tell us how you uh, deployed the deep fake uh, in your paper. Uh, and so what you're examining uh, is uh, how warnings about deep fakes uh, might uh, impact people's ability to discern, right? So this is one of the debates because as Josh and Libby were saying, you know, we need to maybe flag or try to give uh, you know, users a better understanding that media might be manipulated or misleading. Uh, but you're yielding actually a, uh, a somewhat counterintuitive result in this experiment. So if, if I understand your, your research, it's suggesting that the, warner, the warnings are also causing viewers to disbelieve the real images too. Uh, and so just help us understand uh, what you were testing here um, and uh, what some of the implications of that might be. Sure. Um, so uh, the, the studies... Um... There were two studies. One study, we, we made this deep fake that you, you all saw, um, and uh, we basically randomized uh, a, a panel of online participants to see either that deep fake version or the real video version. And then we also randomized whether they see a uh, informational warning that, that simply says that deep fakes exist, computer scientists and policymakers are worried about uh, their impact, and briefly describing what a deep fake is. Um, so it, it was basically a, a one to two sentence warning. Uh, so participants either see that warning or not. And we compared uh, these four conditions to see what the impact of uh, deep fakes, uh, seeing a deep fake is on, on belief in the video and uh, the impact of warnings in uh, both discerning between a real video and a deep fake. And you know, the, the good news is that adding a warning to a deep fake tends to get people to disbelieve deep fakes. Uh, so that's, that's uh, functioning as it's meant to function, that, that, that type of warning. But if the warning ends up by a real video, um, and to emphasize, it's not saying that that real video is fake, it's just simply informing uh, people that deep fakes exist, having that information about deep fakes makes people disbelieve real videos. And we really wanted to zero in on this false positive effect. And that's why our, our second study looked at a real politician uh, saying a real policy stance uh, that most people would not really know about. So Mitt Romney, when he ran for uh, Massachusetts governor, um, had a very strong, very clear statement of uh, his stance of on abortion as pro-choice at that time. Um, and, you know, this is a very atypical stance for a Republican, especially today. So we played this video and we either uh, randomized whether participants saw the warning or no warning. And adding the warning made participants uh, disbelieve this real video of a real politician making a real policy stance. And not only that, it actually impacted uh, uh, the policy stance they thought they had. So getting the warning with the video made people uh, think that Romney had the opposite stance expressed in the video. And this was el elicited by a free response. So we didn't even ask them about policy. We just said, name three facts about Romney. And they still volunteered the fact that they thought uh, Romney had the opposite stance of that, uh, of uh, of what was expressed in the video. Um, so that's, that's basically uh, what, what the study looked at. Uh, thank you for that, John. And, you know, again, just to think about some of the law and policy implications for this, I hope we'll get into this more in Q&A as well. But, you know, so detection, obviously, of the deep fake from a technical perspective is important, right? But you're now focusing on uh, the messaging challenge Right. So what would be, in your view, the right sort of messaging technique that might resonate most with an audience that might get be susceptible to deep fakes? And again, in the Russia, Ukraine context, just to go back to that uh, and what Professor Hathaway was saying at the beginning, you know, we're seeing just a lot of you know, manipulated 
media, a lot of uh, uh, coming out of Russia and Russia affiliated bots, right? But what would be the right way uh, to make people, um, in your view, most wary uh, of taking in that type of news? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no clear optimal messaging strategy about deepfakes as of yet. There are promising studies that have come out uh, that uh, pairing uh, automated detection with crowdsourcing seems to work. Uh, potentially training people to to look for uh, certain features of a video as as potentially a deepfake. Uh, but uh, my research, I think, is focused more on the fact that there aren't that many political deepfakes. Um, there are a lot of videos that are manipulated in other ways. And, you know, it, it's pretty telling that with uh, the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict and, and this uh, very prolific information war, there really aren't that many political deepfakes where uh, a public figure that's known is being uh, manipulated to say something that, that they haven't actually said. Um, and, and, you know, uh, recent research has found that uh, they essentially uh, replicated uh, my findings that uh, if, if people are uh, informed about deepfakes and they're trained to detect deepfakes, uh, the more deep fakes they detect, the more likely they are to think a real video is a deep fake. Uh, and, you know, it, it is a big problem because uh, you don't have a high base rate of deep fakes in the information environment. So emphasizing the fact that, yes, okay, deep fakes may exist. We need to look at flickering. Uh, we need to look at the eyes. The eyes are really difficult to uh, fabricate via deep fakes. But we also need to keep in mind, there are a lot of real videos out there. And you shouldn't think that uh, any video that you have some doubts about is a deep fake. It's actually very unlikely that the video that you're looking at is a deep fake. There, there just aren't that many. So emphasizing uh, the fact that there is this possibility of false positives, I think, would be a good first step, uh, given, given the nascent research uh, uh, that exists, empirically speaking. I want to give Beth uh, an opportunity both to react to that as well as, uh, as Josh and Libby's uh, own paper, because at, at Jigsaw, uh, as a research program manager there, uh, you're just, you're sponsoring a wide range of, of research at the moment uh, at both in-house as well as at peer universities. Uh, that's really kind of looking at these challenges of the best strategies to combat uh, disinformation, manipulated media uh, online. Uh, we can turn to violent extremism as well, maybe in a follow-up question, which is an area where you've been focused on a great deal too. And so, you know, what, are some of the core questions you think uh, where Jigsaw is focusing on in, in this area? Um, you know, where where can social science, in particular, uh, in a university setting, you know, kind of have maximum uh, technical policy uh, impact in your view? Thanks so much, Ted, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll start with a very high level: what is Jigsaw, and, and what am I doing day to day? And then I'd love to offer. Um, a few thoughts on what John just shared, and then and then get to your question on sort of what is the the core direction of our research team at Jigsaw. So Jigsaw is a unit within Google um, that focuses on defending open societies. This can mean a lot of things, and I think it's an intentionally vague mission statement so that we can evolve as threats uh, online evolve. So primarily. Uh, my research team, which is nine interdisciplinary researchers, data scientists, psychologists, ethnographers, anthropology backgrounds, political scientists, um, we primarily focus on misinformation, hate and harassment, and violent extremism. Um, but most of Jigsaw are engineers and product managers who focus on other issues as well, including censorship uh, and um, uh, sort of threats in VR as well. Uh, one of the things that we have done in the past on deep fakes is actually, um, unbeknownst to me until today, is replicate John's study. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a colleague of mine named Andrew Gully and some researchers within Google uh, put warning labels on a deep fake video of Richard Nixon. 
and um, had a control group watch the, the non deep fake version. And what we were testing was different types of warnings, right? If you show a large interstitial that takes over the whole page and really stops someone, you can think this is similar to what Facebook and Instagram have done actually um, on, on a number of misinformation um, posts there. Uh, that had the effect of uh, 40 percent of people thinking that the the deep fake was actually a deep fake so we saw there was an improvement there but similar to john we saw an implied truth effect where if you put that same warning on the true video um it, it also increased sort of the false positives uh so so very similar results and uh, happy to share a, a link to that paper one other really interesting approach that the jigsaw has taken on deep fakes is to try to help the research community build better tools for detection. So to build ML models, as many of you will know, you need a ton of data. And as John noted, there aren't a ton of deep fakes yet. There's, there's actually a bunch of pornography deep fakes, but we didn't want to use those. Um, we actually created a deep fake data set so that researchers could build models for detection. So we, we hired a bunch of actors, um, and then we created thousands of deep fakes, and we released them in a sort of safe uh, contained environment in a competition where we had hundreds of researchers from universities um, and companies use that, that deep fake set to build machine learning models. Um, so that I thought that was a really cool approach to try to get at this. We don't yet have the perfect silver bullet algorithm to detect deep fakes, but, but we would like to. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say that the, the question that is taking up most of my time on a day-to-day -day basis is less about detection and sort of the removal side but more proactively, how can we help people be more resilient to misinformation? It's sort of starting from the premise that we're never going to remove it all. How can we just help people be a little bit more savvy online? And so I have been working on something called inoculation theory. It's a communications method and, and maybe we can tee up the yeah, video. Yeah, we have a video that we're gonna show on this as well. Yeah, so just the, the, the two seconds before we show the video to, to tee it up, um, inoculation theory is this concept similar to a, a physical vaccine where you can actually build mental antibodies, sort of a psychological resistance to an impending attempt to manipulate you. Um, if you can first identify what the manipulation is and then have counter arguments in mind. So what we've done is for a variety of narratives, both extremist narratives say that whites are superior or for vaccine misinformation narrative that vaccines are dangerous, we have created some of these short videos that try to help people gain psychological resistance. The one we're going to show today is actually one of my favorites. It's even more generic than those two examples. It's just about a common manipulation technique online. I think of this as more a general vaccine than a specific vaccine. This is just on the concept of false dichotomies, which we have found are used really frequently across different types of political propaganda. Um, so take a look, and then I will. I can tell you about how this video performed in a test. Either you stop watching the lamestream media, or you want all puppies to die. Makes sense, right? No? Good, because it shouldn't. It's a common manipulation technique called a false dichotomy or a false dilemma. It's designed to make you think you only got two choices to choose from, when in reality, there are more. As with our little dilemma at the beginning, there's no reason why you can't watch mainstream media and want all puppies to live. The two don't rule each other out. And by presenting you with an option that is clearly undesirable and the option the manipulator wants you to pick, your choices are narrowed down for you. A famous example of a false dilemma is this one from Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. My allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy! If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Anakin's claim that Obi-Wan is either with him or is his enemy is a clear case of false dichotomy. Obi-Wan is trying to prevent Anakin from joining the dark side, which naturally involves being critical of Anakin's choices. But just because Obi-Wan disagrees with Anakin doesn't automatically make them enemies. Obi-Wan's reply is actually perfect. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Good old Obi! Be on the lookout for instances of false dichotomies in real life. They're more common than you think. Truth Labs, when things are too black and white, dare to be gray. All right, so that was a little hyperbolic and cheesy because it was actually designed to be a social media ad <laughs> where we could really try to catch someone's attention by being a little extra, little extra. Um, 
But what you saw there was this sort of three-part formula where we warn you, hey, you're going to see this type of manipulation online. Here's an example of it in you know, a, real, uh, a, a real film. Um, and then here's how you should refute it. Here's what's wrong with that. Um, and so I, I really like this model. And we've actually gotten it down to second videos. Um, uh, and we've been showing those both in a lab setting with some of our academic partners at the University of Cambridge and American University. Um, and we've just recently been rolling them out on both Twitter and YouTube um, and testing if people are able to correctly identify what a false dichotomy is and what's wrong with it. Um, so that's, that's a promising new approach to mitigating misinformation. Uh, thank you for that. I wanted to give you a, a second to touch on um, online extremism as well. Uh, and of course, you've spent uh, a lot of time working with those communities. Uh, and so just help us understand sort of in terms of susceptibility to disinformation as opposed to maybe susceptibility to kind of extremist views online that might push you uh, towards taking action in the physical realm. You know, what are some of the core differences there? And, and what are some of the techniques that also from a, based on social science research can help uh, push people away from that? We'll, we'll be talking a little bit about extremism as well in the second panel this morning uh, with some professors who've done a lot of work on fascism and uh, psychology of, of extremism. Just help us understand some of the work that you've done in this space. Sure. So um, when I started at Jigsaw almost three and a half years ago, um, our violent extremism portfolio was exclusively focused on Islamists. So think ISIS and Al Qaeda. Um, but at that time, I knew that there was obviously uh, a whole range of ideological extremism. And at that point, we were pre-Charlottesville, but there was a lot of rumblings online that I was detecting about uh, white nationalism, white supremacy, sort of the, the far right as we know it today. Um, and so I proposed doing a study that used ethnographic methods where I went and talked to mostly former, uh, for the sake of safety, former white supremacists. Uh, and over the course of about a year and a half, I spoke with 36 former white supremacists who ranged from uh, full on leads of neo-Nazi uh, groups all the way to sort of your keyboard warriors who had, you know, they were college students by day and went online to 8 Kuhn or 4chan at night and posted nasty things. Uh, so across that spectrum, I saw a pattern in how they radicalize. And I'll give you the, the sort of TLDR version of it, which is that uh, the radicalization journey is accelerated by the internet. You can be bombarded with and immerse in so much more information and more communities than you ever could before the internet. And that journey often looks like a funnel. Uh, where there are a lot of folks at the beginning of the funnel who are discovering these ideas and very few folks at the end of the funnel who are acting on them. And the perfect analogy is actually a marketing funnel. So if any of you have taken marketing or are familiar, <laughs> there's this phase at the beginning where you discover a product, an, an idea, a concept, and you're sort of learning about it. You're, you're interacting with it kind of passively. Then the second phase, you start to engage with it. There's a little bit more active involvement. Maybe you're clicking into it, you're searching, and you're querying for more information. Um, the third phase is where you really start to buy into that idea and maybe you join a community. Maybe you add a product to your cart. <laughs> um, maybe you add an ideology to your mental cart. Uh, and then the final phase is where you actually take action. Um, and so what we found was very few folks make it all the way down that funnel because there is increasing social costs, right, to actually joining a group or or taking action with a group, but there are so many people who are able with the internet to discover ideas and start to engage with ideas, even if it's just being sort of a keyboard warrior reposting, you know, slurs on Twitter. Um, and when we talk about interventions, um, and to, to Ted's question, you know, what is what is Jigsaw, what are tech companies, what are any of us able to actually do to mitigate this, this journey, this funnel, um, the best approaches are at the beginning. It's really hard to dislodge an idea once someone has bought into it. Um, so there are a couple of interventions, including the type of inoculation videos that you just saw that are trying to reach people really early on and say, can we help give you mental resilience to the claims that you're going to see from extremists online? So I'll, I'll end with just one uh, quick story. We created uh, videos that were about 90 seconds long that focused on two specific common narratives. One, whites are biologically superior, false narrative. 
Two, males are biologically superior, false narrative. Uh, and we had, you know, a very sort of masculine man narrator, and he had a series of memes that he was essentially pre-bunking or deep. He wasn't debunking them. He was trying to show them to you and help people preemptively see what was wrong with them. Um, and some of these memes were really subtle about how uh, Western civilization was superior or about how um, men deserve to be the ones uh, and have historically been the ones making more money, right? And so he walked through in 90 seconds what was wrong with those claims implicitly. Um, and we showed those short videos to um, about 1,000 Americans. And uh, we oversampled for young white men, actually, because we know that those are the folks who are most at risk and susceptible to these, these memes and these narratives. Um, and what we found was really interesting. For the vast majority of people, these videos helped. These videos helped them in two ways. They helped them better spot other examples of propaganda when we showed them other propaganda and debriefed them later uh, for ethics. Uh, and they also helped them say that they were less likely to support the creators of those memes, less likely to share them, less likely to offer financial support, less likely to do physical support um, behind these movements. Um, but the really interesting twist that we actually just published a paper on last week was that these inoculation videos don't work for people who already believed the misinformation. So if you're already a white supremacist, I can't inoculate you against being a white supremacist, um, which, which maybe sounds intuitive, but I think it was a really important finding to say, this is not a silver bullet. This will work for one segment of the population, but not everyone. Um, thank you for that. So uh, I have a lot of follow-up questions, but I, I just wanna stop and incorporate uh, folks from the audience as well as online. So those online can submit a question virtually uh, and uh, Ona can help us with that portion and anyone here uh, just raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. I can jump in with yeah. the questions from online. So uh, there's a question from an online uh, viewer about um, whether the US government is using white noise. And I guess for me what this question raises is how do we distinguish between white not noise and providing accurate information, uh, right? So, so what, how do we know when we're in one world or the other? Um, I think when I think about sort of the difference maybe between propaganda or, or white noise and, and who is, I guess, who is engaging in propaganda, one thing I think about is what is the state's level of control over the flow of information um, and so when I'm thinking about somewhere like Xinjiang, even within China, that is probably one of the most tightly controlled places within an already very controlled information ecosystem. And so in that region, there's just such a higher barrier to entry for people to actually um, get their messages out. You know, if you think of, of a Uyghur person currently living in Xinjiang, um, even if they were able to get their content out without being censored um, onto the Chinese internet that is so siloed um, and the platforms that they use are so siloed from most of um, I would say the rest of the world that it's it's really difficult for people outside of China to see that content and that is that is even hypothesizing that they would be able to post that um, and I think you know even moving abroad there have been investigations that um, the Chinese state tries to um, intimidate or harass um, Uyghur activists or Uyghurs living abroad to sort of prevent them even from um, spreading that information and so for me it's more a question of like the freedom of information flow and um, what is the freedom for for other people outside of the government to offer competing narratives. Reaction to that Josh also? Okay, okay perfect. Let's get to the audience. Yes, please. And just uh, briefly uh, introduce yourself as well and press the green button. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Hongyi. I'm a current student at Yale College. Um, so I have a question about the measurement or the metrics used to remove um, problematic content online. So we talk about false positives. And I know there's a very significant trade off between new precision and recall. I know this is a problem that Meta faces. Um, and as an incoming program manager at Meta, I think this is something I care a lot about. <laughs> um, so basically, um, Precision being that you make sure the amount of information, um, problematic content you take down are actually problematic so that you reduce the risk of, you know, maybe causing them to doubt to real actual content. Um, but the other is that maybe um, there's, there's a trade-off with recall, which is that um, the amount of content that's out there that's actually problematic, you only get a small subset of them because you're trying to get accuracy right. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of flag on tech companies that maybe they're not taking sufficient problematic content down. So how do you think about that trade-off? Um, that's the first question. And this 
quick follow up to that is also I'm curious about um, the role of um, policy or law enforcement in this place. So I see a lot of um, activity around educating um, the public or even um, getting um, social media companies to act. But I wonder if um, what's the place for maybe law enforcement or for law to come in. Uh, we have like the FTC deception um, act, um, advertising stuff. So could that possibly be extended? Not in this case, but you know more generally regarding disinformation. Yeah, thank you. Beth, do you wanna try to take that one? And offer a few thoughts um, and congratulations on future meta employment. Um, so I, I can't speak on behalf of my colleagues at Google Trust and Safety who are really the ones in charge of figuring out the balance of precision and recall that you talked about for removing problematic content. But I'll, I'll, I'll offer a thought, which is that um, when we talk about problematic content, we're actually talking about a ton of different types of content that have very different attributes. Some verticals uh, or topics like uh, child sexual abuse material, terrorist content, it's far more black and white. It's not entirely black and white, but it is much easier both to define and to train an algorithm to detect. And so when we are talking about increasing precision and recall for terrorist content, um, yes, there, there, is, there is very high precision on those classifiers. There's very high precision across companies too, in terms of what we're removing. Um, but for something that is a, gray, a much grayer area, like misinformation or even hate speech, um, this is where precision and recall, uh, the, the ratios sort of flip a little bit. And so that's where there is a much lower threshold for precision uh, algorithmically, but a much higher uh, rate of recall and sort of manual review. So I would just say that those, the, the problematic content bucket needs to be sort of divided up when you're looking at that. Um, and, and lastly, on the topic of recall, companies think about content differently in moments that are very high stakes. So think about elections, think about wars, right? They're, they're going in and they're saying, this is a really important moment to make sure that uh, the wrong information about the result of an election, the wrong information about uh, the welfare of the Ukrainian president doesn't get amplified. Um, so they're, they're also taking into account the, the political context. On the law enforcement question, uh, we do have some in-house uh, legal expertise here uh, to my own left. I mean, I think part of the question here, right, is under what conditions could law enforcement uh, monitor uh, susceptibility to extremism uh, or disinformation online? And then at what point would you then, and particularly if it's First Amendment protected, no matter how disgusting it is, and then at what point would you then cross the threshold, right, to sort of engaging in or taking concrete steps or advocating violence, right? And that's a close, that's a close call for law enforcement in terms of being able to act on this, some of this information. So we have some questions. We have a number of questions online, um, but, but one I think that follows on um, interestingly here, um, and this is I think primarily for you, Beth. Um, so the question is, what are the implications of large tech companies altruistically leading the movement against disinformation? Are there any viable alternatives? And I guess this is the question is like, who's responsible and how should this be done? Is it law enforcement? Is it tech companies? How do we, how do we manage these, uh, these various actors in, in the process of figuring out how to combat uh, disinformation? Yeah, Jigsaw is in a great position on this one to say it's all of us who are responsible. Uh, and luckily, uh, we're an arm of Google that gets to collaborate really widely and freely, um, particularly with the academic community, but also with civil society. We work with groups like the Anti-Defamation League, for example, who have deep expertise in anti-Semitism and hate speech. Um, and we also work with, with scholars from a huge range of universities also around the world, including in the global south. So um, I think, you know, I, the answer is definitely not it's just tech companies or it's just civil society. I think it has to be a collaboration. And I'm actually really excited by the model that um, our team is pushing, which is do really early stage foundational research, primarily with academics, right, where you have really rigorous sort of ethical guidelines around how new concepts like inoculation theory are developed. Um, and then once you start to get a promising proof of concept, then bring that over to the tech companies where it can be scaled. But, but I think using the sort of collaborative um, early stage prototyping with civil society and academia ensures that there are a lot of those sort of ethical guardrails and considerations right from conception. Get uh, anyone here uh, in person. Yes, please. And uh, introduce yourself and green light. 
and you should push the button that goes green and then uh, speak into the, the microphone. Yep. Hi, um, I'm Samith, junior majoring in global affairs and computer science. Um, so last week in, or two weeks ago in our first session, uh, we were talking about AI and you know all the biases and regulations of AI. Um, and I was wondering, um, in the context of your research, uh, in particular, the paper, Josh and Libby, you were talking about, you said you used a machine learning algorithm to kind of dissect the main topics of conversation, right? So I was wondering, how do you account for, you know, the bias of the algorithm itself when you are doing such research or even in creating the deep fake video, right? Do you rely on like, like humans going in afterwards and tweaking? Uh, you know, and just kind of reviewing everything. But if you have a massive amount of information like that, like, how does that, how does that even happen? And, you know, it was very interesting to see in your research, the, the photo that, you know, the words were so different, that word map, but genocide was like a huge word in both of them. And I just wonder why um, that, that was the case. So. Um. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I guess speaking kind of specifically on like topic modeling, um, it's kind of a strangely, I've found, I'm definitely not an expert, but I found it's kind of a fuzzy science um, in terms of it requires a lot of um, researcher validation. Um, there's not necessarily, for instance, even identifying the number of topics that you want your algorithm to find is kind of a process of trial and error. And you can run certain um, calculations that, for instance, um, can calculate things like semantic coherence or exclusivity. And you can kind of try to find a perfect balance of how many topics do I have that sort of are independent of each other but make sense. And so um, we found that it took a lot of iterations of running through, okay, what if we run it with this number of topics, how would that affect our results? And it definitely, um, depending on the choices you make, it definitely does affect your results. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily a form of bias as much as it is a form of um, not just blindly trusting an algorithm to find the answers for you. You have to, you definitely need to bring um, some amount of, of background knowledge of the context of what you're researching. Um, and and be able to validate and spend a lot of time validating afterwards. Yeah. I think just to add on to that, I think I totally agree. Of an art and a science, I think we try to bring, draw in as much as possible our kind of expertise in terms of Chinese political strategy as well. We've seen this white noise strategy not only online but to a certain extent also in real life. One example of this is actually during the recent um, Chinese Winter Olympics when China selected a Uyghur um, uh, athlete to light the cauldron during the opening ceremony. This athlete wasn't particularly high profile. It was a pretty naked attempt to kind of make this grand gesture of like, ethnic unity and distract from some of the human rights allegations. And so we had known that this was a strategy um, even coming in. Uh, and I think the topic modeling was just to more, more so quantify and see kind of the prevalence of this um, on Twitter. Yeah, John, any comments on this? Yeah, uh, just as a quick addition um, in regards to, to, to this problem with deep fakes, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the reasons that, um, you know, it, it's still an art uh, that there are pay for deep fake services out there is because yes, you know, the deep face lab could get you 90% of the way there, but there does need to be kind of a human element to touch up uh, artifacts that would otherwise be left over um, in, in a deep fake video. And conversely, new research has found that a, the hybrid approach, uh, so automatically detecting deep fakes, but also having somebody uh, make a judgment call as to whether it is or not a deep fake uh, has has tended to show uh, ha, ha, has shown itself to be more effective than just relying on an algorithm to detect deep fakes alone, uh, and a big reason for that is because uh, uh, the the human brain can can also look at a certain context information that an algorithm cannot. Um, so uh, this this recent study has found that especially with uh, known public figures, such as uh, global or uh, national leaders, uh, people tended to be more effective than the best algorithm in detecting deep fakes. Um, 
not so much with uh, this data set of, of random people uh, that are just actors and uh, there exist deep fakes of, of a normal person speaking uh, and, and saying something uncontroversial. There, uh, the computer can actually probably do uh, uh, a little better because it, it, there isn't as much context involved. So I, I think absolutely, I think it's, it's always going to be kind of a combination both in the manufacture of deep fakes, but also in the detection of deep fakes. Yeah. Emphasizes the importance of human in loop uh, oversight or decision making on that. A uh, question from the uh, yeah, virtually, we have and then some we'll get to questions for the audience. Um, and and these are directed, I think, first and foremost at um, at John. Um, so uh, the first one uh, I'm going to ask two because they're interrelated. So one is um, says social science has potential to find positive steps that can mitigate misinformation, but to what degree can social science also be used by misinformers to optimize their misinformation? for example, by the Chinese government, is there any way to mitigate this? And then a connected question by someone else is considering the false negative effects of presenting warning labels on real, lab real videos, it seems a more cost-effective means of manipulation rather than making deep fakes would be simply to put warning messages on real videos. Um, so I thought these were, these were really interesting questions uh, and uh, thought that you might have something to say about that. Yeah, that's uh, those are great questions, I, I, and I think um, uh, research on deepfakes, especially, uh, I really, really needs at this point some ethical framework um, because uh, at this point uh, there's a lot of gray areas. There's a lot of research that's coming out that's that's in gray areas. Um, uh, so uh, my research. Uh, uh, in, in, in collaboration with, with my dissertation committee, we, we really uh, talked about the ethics of making a deep fake. So uh, one compromise that we came up with is that we didn't want to make a deep fake of a real public politician. So in study two, we did not make a deep fake of Romney uh, because we, we don't want to be in any way uh, creating misinformation. There have been studies where uh, researchers have created deep fakes um, to test the impact and you know that they got a politician a, a public figure to say something they haven't actually said um and you know that went through their irb uh, boards and i i do think that because this is such a new area of research we there is a huge demand for somebody to to draft a an ethical framework paper that gives guidelines to social scientists as uh, how to best mitigate the risks involved in, in doing deep fake research, not only uh, in, in kind of educating uh, malicious actors into how to best optimize what they're doing, but also uh, this, this uh, threat of releasing misinformation into the broader environment. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think we, we need uh, more ethical guidance there and I'm hopeful that social scientists can take on that mantle. Um, and in regards to the second question, uh, I think um, my research is very much interested in that in that potential that uh, we may have a situation where deep fakes don't even really need to exist uh, for deception to occur. Um, the The implications of uh, our findings is that it may be possible for a politician to at least partially disavow previous policy statements, not even by saying, oh, that was a deep fake, but by saying deep fakes exist. Um, so this, is, this was an online study, uh, online participants. Uh, we, we wouldn't really need to see to what an extent it replicates in a more realistic context to see if these effects decay, but there is ultimately a, a source of concern. And I'm not really sure what policy implications there can be if if it is very effective to just say deep fakes exist uh, to to sow doubt in real videos uh, but uh, I, I guess kind of I want to emphasize that this is this was just two studies on online convenience samples and we absolutely need to see to what an extent these effects are uh, more long term and more durable in more realistic context before we panic and try to uh, try to fix a problem that might not be as as bad of a problem as 
it seems from, uh, from this first pass uh, of empirical analysis. Uh, we're getting close here on the end of the time. I just want to get the, get the question here. Yeah, Andrew. I'm Andrew Doris, I'm a second year MA student at Jackson. Um, yep. As you know, part of what makes disinformation so insidious is that it tries to discredit authoritative sources of knowledge, kind of get people disoriented, can't tell up and down, so they wind up not trusting what, what they should trust. And personally, I know I have some kind of like Trumpy aunts and uncles who their response to, to Facebook <laughs> warning banner is basically to discredit fact checking itself as like left wing propaganda. Right? The idea that Snopes is a partisan site, for example. How do you get people to trust the source of the inoculation or of, of the warning label on the deep fake? Is there um, maybe that's platform dependent, but is there any research on how to present it in a way that doesn't make people defensive? Alan Beth? That is the exact next question we are asking. So I love that question. Um, we are looking to things that people already trust, to, to messengers and sources that people are already trusting and trying to work with them. Uh, the nice thing about inoculation is it is just a communications technique and anyone can use it. In fact, extremists can and do use it. Um, but that means that messengers of any variety uh, on the right and on the left in the center can also use it. So right now we are in the process of identifying and working with a handful of YouTube and TikTok creators who already have built up trust with their audiences. Um, and maybe they typically talk about um, fixing cars and motorcycles on their YouTube channel. And their audience may skew to one side of the political aisle that doesn't listen to uh, Snopes and doesn't trust fact checkers. Um, but if they have the trust of their audience and they say, hey, you might see misleading claims online about the election, suddenly that's a trusted messenger. So that's the, that's the route that we're going. This is really hypothetical, so don't quote me on this working yet, um, but this is, this is the sort of avenue that we're going to try to lock into pre-existing trust. Thank you. Uh, we are reaching the end of time, so one hand up there. Why don't you get that question out, and then uh, I think we'll close out. That's sorry to uh, pose a false dichotomy here, but. Um, <laughs> Introduce uh, yourself. Just for sorry, a uh, my name's Caroline. I'm a first year law student. Um, my question is, do you think that it's better to kind of like overcorrect for these deep fakes with uh, algorithms that are taking content down? Or do you think it's better to undercorrect? Because as you can see, like when content is removed, it is very hard to get it back instituted. And even just with like offensive content online or on Twitter and YouTube, you know, sometimes LGBT creators are censored for these sorts of things. But at the same time, if you let deep fakes persist, that could also pose challenges um, for information. So just wondering to hear your thoughts on how algorithms should be programmed. Well, that is indeed a false dichotomy. Um, <laughs> luckily, I think that experiment is playing out right now because each of the platforms has a different philosophy on removals. So some platforms like TikTok have a much higher threshold uh, for removals. And so that is an environment that you could contrast to um, a YouTube in the middle or even a BitChute or a Rumble, which are also video platforms that have basically a very laissez-faire approach to removals. And you could contrast the sort of ecosystems on each of those and see the pros and cons of each, right? So on, on, on the one end of the spectrum with the BitChutes and Rumbles, you can have every possible conspiracy theory. You can have debates about how flat the earth is. Um, but, but you're also going to have lots of hate speech and lots of harmful and derogatory content. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum on TikTok, you're absolutely right. There are removals of pro LGBT, um, content removals of Uyghur related content, right? There's, there's sort of this overcorrection as you called it. Um, and so there's, there's certainly cons to that approach, but there is much less of the, uh, of the hate speech and the extremist content on the shoot. So, so I would say, look, look right now at how that is playing out between platforms and you'll sort of get the whole range of pros and cons. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Cool, that was great. So uh, stretch, take a break. There's some food and drink out back. Uh, we're gonna start uh, promptly at, at 1030 with our next session uh, prior to lunch. So thank you very much. That was awesome.